Well, hello. Today is May 24th. My name is Carl Connor. Welcome to the Stepping Stones Project. So glad you could join us here today. We're studying in 1 Thessalonians. We're up to chapter 4, and we're going to cover a variety of topics, including the idea of what's called soul sleep. I've been preaching about this church in Thessalonica. This is some of the ruins that are there. I think I may have shown this one before, but this is, shows some of the archways that have now been uncovered and shows the areas in the city of Thessalonica where the people in the church of Thessalonica would have walked. We continue in our text, this letter to the Thessalonians, the church at Thessalonica. Uh, we hear Paul as he's getting towards the end of his letter. He'll wrap up next week, uh, and then we'll go into the second Thessalonians. And, and then after that, just so you know, we're going to go back to the Old Testament for a while and uh, go back and look at, uh, at some of the, the uh, wisdom literature back in the, in the Old Testament. But continuing on 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, uh, starting at verse 1. Finally then, brothers, we ask and urge you in the Lord Jesus that as you received from us how you ought to walk and to please God, just as you are doing, that you do so more and more. So this is a call for what's called sanctification. We mentioned before to you all that justification is the part of your salvation when you become, well, saved. It's the, you're justified. You are declared innocent. This is the legal term, that you are declared innocent even though you had these sins that could be counted against you. The second phase of that, and by the way, if you go look at our Stepping Stones logo, you'll find three Stepping Stones, one that represents each of those in the logo. Maybe I should have thrown it up here. Um, and so the second one is then sanctification. This process day by day after you become saved of becoming slowly more and more holy. Uh, sanctify means to make holy. So this is the making holy, the, the, the taking the sandpaper, which is not always comfortable, I'd like to point out, and rubbing off your rough edges, okay, and rubbing off those pieces. And so it's interesting that the, Paul is writing to them, and he tells the, the church, a very young church, that as you received from us how you ought to walk, what does that mean, well, how you ought to walk? Well, it's your Christian walk. It's an analogy that Paul uses often, and it's one I think that is very appropriate. You do not uh, get your way to become holy in one step. It is a walk. Well, how much of a walk? Well, day by day, you, you, you rise up, and you take up your cross, and you follow him, and you walk one step at a time, one step at a time. Sometimes we get stuck, and we're not ready to take that next step. And if you think about all the steps we have left to take, if you get stuck on one and you get kind of left back in the road by the side of the road for a while, you can imagine us not moving forward how much we're missing out on by not taking that one next step. We're just stuck right there. And so this is part of what our church is about, is hoping to give you the courage to take that next step. Well, first of all, to identify it, and then the courage to take it. So just as you receive from us how you ought to walk and to please God, just as you are doing, that you do so more and more. Keep walking. Keep taking that next step. Keep walking in holiness. Keep trying to find areas where you can let God take over more of your life. We as an American populace, as I have said, compartmentalize everything. Okay, my marriage goes over here. My work goes over here. Some of you, like I have been, combine your marriage and your work together, like you work with your spouse. I know Amy and Dion do that, for example, and it provides for a very different life if you, if you let the compartmentalization between those two come together. Some people say, how could you ever possibly allow that to happen? Oh my gosh, I would, I would hate it. And I'm like, well, I'm not sure what that says, but <laughs> I can tell you, I, I loved it for nine years when I worked shoulder to shoulder with my wife uh, during those years and we can't admit it. Although I'm getting to do it a little bit more at home now, which is kind of cool as I'm smiling over at her. Um, so as we go through this, if we break down that compartmentalization and let God break over all those areas of our life, your finances, your calendar, your life, your work, your marriage, your children, your friendships, then go through and let him go through. That's him doing it more and more. For you, verse two, for you know what instructions we gave you through the Lord Jesus. Verse three, for this is the will of God your sanctification. Say that again. This is the will of God, your sanctification. Does God want you to get saved? Does God want you to be justified? Does God want all who are willing to be able to be set right with him and be justified? Absolutely yes. Does it end there? No, it does not end there. It continues on. The will of God includes then beyond your justification, the sanctification process, that you abstain, amongst other things here, from sexual immorality, that each one of you know how to control his own body or her own body in holiness and honor, not in the passion of lust like the Gentiles who do not know God. So this is really interesting. 
This is one of the things that you're going to encounter. Maybe I mention it too often, but I think it's important to repeat that there is a prevailing thought in America that if something is of our nature, to deny it is evil. I'll say it another way. I was born this way. Do you ever hear that? I was born this way. Well, it's being used right now as an argument for certain sexual orientations, other things that are out there, and, and so forth. And I, I think it's an important thing to, to argue that history says all the time. Yes, okay, so I was born this way. So the, the, the concept of someone being born this way, therefore it glorifies God, runs contrary to our entire Christian understanding of our human makeup. What is that? Specifically, we believe that inside of all humans, our human nature is corrupted. It is not glorify God because a human nature, all of us inherited sin. We're going to talk about this a little bit later. All of us inherited a sinful nature from Adam. Okay, so all of us come down from there. And in that sinful nature, that does not glorify God. So if you put this in this context, this particular activity, I'm not trying to beat up on homosexuality, but look, there's all kinds of things like this that we, 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 we bring up and we just say, well, this is, I'm only human. I'm only human. <coughs> Excuse me, that cough in your ears. Um, I'm only human, or this is what I have, this is how I am, this is just the way I am. I, 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 you know, I don't want to deny who I am. Okay, that sounds in a, in a humanistic approach, glorifying the human side like that's something really good. But in fact, a lot of Christianity is in fact just that. It is denial of our human nature, of our, of our sarks is the Greek word, which means flesh. Denial of our flesh is in fact exactly what it is that God calls us to do, and to deny what's inside of there. So to learning how to control our body and be able to then learn to then glorify God through that is exactly what God is calling us to do. So it, you know, to say, for example, that a particular activity, you were born with it, it's in your nature, therefore the implication is that it must be right or it must be good or it must be something there it is exactly directly contrary to this idea that we believe that in fact all human beings and all nature uh, uh, the inner f uh, flesh actually denies God and does not glorify him. So as a quick comment there, um, Paul is using that as an example of the type of sin there. What about like gambling? What if you were born with a genetic disposition towards gambling? Does that mean it's okay to gamble away your house or your finances? No. Let's say you were born with a genetic disposition uh, towards fill in sin name here, what, whatever you want to put in there. Does that make it okay? No, it does not. And so uh, it's fascinating uh, experiences. I'm watching in America this, this idea of um, I was born this way equals glorifies God, or at least okay, or shouldn't be, the should, Bible shouldn't say anything about that. Continuing on, verse 5, not in the passion of lust like the Gentiles who do not know God, that no one transgress and wrong his brother in this matter, because the Lord is an avenger in all these things. So we told you beforehand and solemnly warned you. For God has not called us for impurity, but in holiness. That's an interesting idea. God has not called us for impurity. He didn't call us to stay where he found you. Okay, if he would, he would have just saved you and then like poof, and you'd be like taken up to heaven. Like, and Lord Jesus, forgive me my sins. Amen. Poof, you'd be gone. He didn't call you to stay where he found you, guys. He called you to glorify him through your walk, to glorify him by becoming more like him, to work on some of these things and be able to glorify him through that. For God has not called us for impurity, but in holiness. Therefore, whoever disregards this, disregards not man, but God, who gives his Holy Spirit to you. So when you're refusing, for example, to walk, if you're refusing to take that next step, it's one thing to not know what your next step is. You could argue that there's probably something you could do but nevertheless it's one thing to not know what your next step is i've been there a couple times but it's another thing to know really in your heart honest that if you close your eyes you don't have to it's pretty obvious for you what it is you need to do but then to refuse it and to say oh no i refuse to do that well that's that's another aspect so <clears throat> that that's of course disregards not man but god who gives his holy spirit to you now concerning brotherly love so this is this is a uh, a term here that there's a couple terms actually in the New Testament relates to this. Uh, koinonia, I mentioned before, is a Greek word. Koinonia is this fellowship that's there, and that, that's the, kind of the general concept. This particular word, brotherly love, uh, has to do 
with phileo. Somebody might know the city of Philadelphia is the city of brotherly love. There you go. So phileo, this is a brother love. There's different, there's like four major types of love in Greek. I was talking to my daughter Sarah about this the other day, that there's the different ones there. Some of you might know the word agape, which is an unconditional love. Okay, and there are other types of ones as well. Well, this phileo, this brotherly love here, um, you have no need for anyone to write for you. I, Paul's saying, I don't need to tell you about this. I don't need to tell you about brotherly, sisterly love, this upholding of one another in this church, the, the, the raising up, the speaking life to one another. I don't need to tell you about that, for you yourselves have been taught by God to love one another. You all got that, is what he's saying. He's recommending the church of Thessalonica, how good they're doing this. For that indeed is what you are doing to all the brothers throughout Macedonia, which is, of course, the area of Greece, modern-day Greece, where they are. But we urge you, brothers, to do this more and more. You got it. You know how to do brotherly love, but keep doing it. Don't lose that. Keep walking in that love. Keep walking in what you're doing. And to inspire to live quietly and to mind your own affairs and to work with your hands as we have instructed you so that you may walk properly before outsiders and be dependent on no one. I have a question for you. Put your hands over on the keyboard and answer me this one. In your opinion, did Jesus of Nazareth live quietly? Verse 11, and to aspire to live quietly and to mind your own affairs. This is, I spent some time in prayer about this this morning. Okay, God, through your holy word, you're telling me to live quietly, and you're also telling me to emulate Christ. Um, okay, let me ask you this question. Was there any substantial period of, Je oh, sure you're already there. Was there any substantial portion of Jesus' life where he lived quietly, worked with his hands? And to that, I think that's true. It's true. He just jumped on to, to go with that. Yeah, the first 30 years, we don't know a darn thing about Jesus except he was born and he got lost once at the temple. Pretty much that's about all we know about him. Y'all follow? I mean, that's, that is just about everything we know about him. And the born part, no offense, is just he was born. We don't really know anything about him as a person. The only snippet we really have from his childhood or early adulthood is there. But you know, he comes in his own at approximately 30 years old. He did a lot during that time period. He had friends. He grew. He went to parties. He hung out with people. He did stuff. There's a whole, I mean, we only have a snippet from the last 10%, last three years, roughly. His ministry lasts three years before he dies, approximately, not even three whole years. And, and you know, two and a half-ish. And, and so, you know, that's all that we have. And we have some good details from that time period. But the rest of the time, he, well, lived quietly and worked with his hands if you will. And I think that's fascinating. But there certainly was a time when the time is right when he needed to step up and do something other than live quietly. And then, oh my gosh, he shook the world during that short time period. So to put this in perspective, there is a verb there I'm skipping over, to aspire to live quietly. If you go back to the very beginning of verse 11, to aspire to live quietly. It doesn't mean you live quietly all the time, but that's your desire. Do we see a desire for Jesus to live quietly? In the garden, what did you say about the cup? Oh, Lord, if possible, let this cup do what? What do you think? He's praying, if possible, Lord, let this cup, yeah, pass from me, right? And if it passed from him, what do you think his life might have been back? Could I argue that it could have gone back to being more, at least more so quiet? If you all follow my point. So did he aspire to live quietly? I would argue that he probably would. Paul, you got some comments there that he lived quietly, spoke words of wisdom. His first 30 years of life gave him the foundation for the three remaining years. I would agree with that. I think that, that that's really good. So I find this interesting. So recently I, I've encountered some of this idea in my mind as I've been thinking about this, uh, to live quietly and work with my hands. I've got a project I'm working on right now that I'm working down in the woodshop quite a bit. And this is, I commented on the street and are now working together down in the woodshop and really enjoying that. And um, I, you know, last night as I was praying, I was working on the lathe and, and thinking about and I was watching shavings come off and uh, praying as I was doing so. And, and working with my hands is very, very enjoyable at this point in my life. And uh, it's something that I would encourage you. And it might not be the wood shop, might be in the garden, might be, I, it might be knitting or needlepoint or whatever it is. 
But I, I would encourage you this weekend to think about ways in the next few months that you can work with your hands if you aren't already doing so. And uh, I, would, I, I think that there's something in that that really is very rewarding for each and every one of us. And uh, Paul, I think you're doing some of that right now as well. And I, I certainly agree with that. That's kind of neat. Okay. Sherry says, my dad used to these verses as a reason we should not rely on anyone but ourselves. Well, yes, there's that. Um, uh, of course, it, it's, uh, you know, the, the, the overwhelming theme, of course, in the Bible, Sherry, is, of course, that we do, in fact, rely on others. A cord of small pants that are easily broken. But I know your father used it that way. And I, and I agree. So, continuing on. <clears throat> so now Paul changes topics pretty dramatically, starting with verse 13. And he says, but we do not want you to be uninformed, brothers, about those who are asleep. What does it mean to be asleep in this concept? And he says, we don't want you to be uninformed about those that are asleep, those that are what? Dead. Yes. Um, so it's fascinating that, that this is a, a term uh, This is used in the Old Testament. Um, and then, you know, uh, reach a point where then King David fell asleep and slept with his fathers. And we, you know what I'm saying? And it, <clears throat> it's very common. And the, the only problem with this is people kind of get, read more into the sleep idea than just saying he died, if you will, or, or you know what I'm saying, or about those who are, who are died, you know, who have died. So um, it, it, it is exactly what that means. So the, the concept of what's called soul sleep is one that I've gotten questions on before. Soul sleep, if you haven't heard about the idea, is basically that when you die, you go temporarily into a spot where you're sleeping in the ground and you're there and you'll be woken up with, at, at the final rapture, for example. Okay, and I'm going to speak against that viewpoint here in just a minute. Verse 14, so since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so through Jesus, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep. And so reading these verses, you can see where people might interpret that, that they're sleeping there in the ground, if you will. For this we declare to you by a word from the Lord, that we who are alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will not precede those who have fallen asleep. So we talked about the three steps, of course, in, in, in salvation, three different parts that, that Paul teaches us, justification being the first, sanctification being some of the focus, the early part of the sermon, and the last, of course, is glorification. And glorification is that moment when we go to meet Lord in, the Lord in heaven, which can happen two ways. Either you die and you're going to go and join him, and I will argue that the moment that you die, you instantly go and join him, although your body is placed into the ground. We'll talk about your body in a second. Um, so either that happens when you die, that's glorification, or the second coming of the Lord, when we're then, as we're going to hear described in just a second. Uh, in which case, if you're, as these people are saying, that if in fact we are, uh, we there, you know, we're there, and of course then the, the rapture comes. And suddenly we have an opportunity to then go up with God and, and, and you know, meet him in the air, as you're about to read about. Um, then we would, of course, then that would be glorification that, that without you having to die. So you're going to get to heaven, if you're a Christian, one way or the other, either by dying, going to heaven, or by obviously being raptured up, going to heaven. If I have my druthers, I'll take the rapture option, just me, but hey, whatever, whatever it is, right? All right. Right. And so Paul says to be absent in the body is to be with the Lord and Savior. Yes, it's another. There are actually a lot of verses we could use to talk about this. Uh, for verse 16, for the Lord himself will descend from heaven. That's Jesus. So Jesus will come with a cry of command with the voice of an archangel. Does that mean Jesus' voice is an archangel or does that mean there's an archangel with him? Mm, could be either. I like to think of it that means that the archangel is with him, but either one's possible. With the sound of the trumpet of the God. Okay, so presumably Gabriel's there and there's his trumpet and he blows that note and suddenly it happens. In the twinkling of an eye, we are changed. And the dead in Christ will rise first. Okay? So the Christian view here is that those who have died, are, their bodies are in the ground, but their souls are with Jesus in heaven in a state where they are waiting for their resurrected bodies. So the dead in Christ will rise first. So their bodies will be resurrected. Are their bodies going to look exactly the same? The resurrected body will be identical to what we have today? Okay, okay, <laughs> because you have six feet further to rise. You're funny. Okay, so he says she hopes not. She she, she would like to, to her body to be slightly different. Yeah, and I, do we have any examples of this of a resurrected body looking slightly different than what it, what our other physical body was? Do we have any examples of that? What's the guy's name this happened to? 
Jesus. And this is, I mean, his resurrected body is slightly different than what happened there. It's sort of interesting. Are there parts of, the, of, the, of his previous body that are clearly there? Sure. The marks on his nails, his feet, and his side are there and they're present. Does it seem like he's not exactly of the same likeness as he was in his physical body? Yeah, that's, of course, the common explanation why she thinks, why you know, Mary thinks he's the gardener, okay? <laughs> because it doesn't look exactly the same. But then this is why Thomas is like, wait a minute, wait a minute. I want to see the nail marks. And you all know the story there, of course. Okay, so the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. So we will always be with the Lord. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. So this idea, and we're going to talk more about this in just a second, but is the, um, of soul sleep is, is one. There's actually there's a couple of, of Christian denominations that sort of hold to this uh, that are out there. And I, I, I would not agree with their, their interpretation at this particular point. It doesn't really change your theology much if you do believe it. Um, this is an example of one that I can understand why people would say it, but I, I disagree with it from that perspective. So let's go ahead and, and talk just a little bit about it the uh, kind of the background for part of this. One of the oldest texts that we actually have is 1 Corinthians that speaks about some of these topics. And 1 Corinthians 15 is great because it talks about the resurrection of the dead. And I just kind of love the way Paul writes because he just got some punch to it in some spots. So just listen for a minute. You know, the font's kind of small on the screen there. As I pick up 1 Corinthians 15, I'm going to start over at verse 12. Now, if Christ is proclaimed as raised from the dead, how can some of you say there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain, and your faith is in vain. We are even found to be misrepresenting God because we testified that God, about God that he raised Christ, whom he did not raise, if it is true, the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile and you are still in your sins, then those who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. And if in Christ we have hope in this life only, then we of all people are most to be pitied. But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For as by a man came death, by a man has also come the resurrection of the dead. Okay, so by a man came death. Who's that? That's Adam. Death came from Adam. Adam's sin and his sinful nature was inherited by us all. Every one of us who inherited that sinful nature has succumbed to that sinful nature except one, Jesus. Jesus had the propensity to sin. He could have sinned because he was human, but he chose not to. And because of that, he was then, of course, then a perfect sacrifice for all of us. It's a more complicated topic we can talk about sometimes. But just as a quick comment, this, is the, this propensity to sin is brain to each and every one of us. It's part of the human nature. For just as man by a man came death, by a man has come also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all be made alive. And just to make sure you heard me correctly there, every one of us inherited the, the propensity, the, the, the tendency to sin, and that did include Jesus. But that doesn't mean Jesus sinned. Don't misunderstand me there. He was perfect up until our sins were placed upon him at the cross. Okay, some deep, 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 deep stuff here. So also in Christ shall all be made alive. 23, but each of us in his own order. Christ, the first fruits, then all at his coming, those who belong to Christ. The first fruits are literally the first harvest. So the first harvest of the harvest of the next, if you will, species is then those who are resurrected. Christ is the first of the resurrected, the first of this new species, if you will, that we will all become. And he finishes up, I skip down to 32B because it's just too fun to pass up, that if the dead are not raised, then hey, Paul says, let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we die. <laughs> Kill up, Paul. <laughs> it's like, look, there is no point in anything we're doing if that is not true. Just saying. <laughs> okay. 1 
First Thessalonian 4 takeaways. I have three of them for you this particular week. Number one, walk in holiness. Walk in holiness. When you stumble, ask for help from others to help pick you up. Walk in holiness. When you stumble, ask for help from others to help pick you up. If you fell down, you probably need help. You could stand up on your own and try to get on your own. Please consider the possibility of the other people in the church helping you. It just might be why you're here. Number one, with that, I would back up with the verses then starting at 1 Thessalonians 4.1. Finally then, brothers, we ask and urge you in Lord Jesus that as you receive from us how you ought to walk and to please God, just as you were doing, that you do so more and more. Takeaway number two. Live quietly. Perhaps I should have worded it, aspire to live quietly. This is an interesting one for me as I'm thinking about this a lot. I don't know that I often live quietly. I probably live more like the Stephen Curtis Chapman song, Live Out Loud, more often. But I think this is good for me, at least this weekend, to think about. And in what areas of my life I need to live quietly, to live small, and to think about how exactly that God wants me to do it. At least until the point when it's not time to live quietly. We urge you, brothers, to do this more and more, to aspire to live quietly, to mind your own affairs, and to work with your hands. And number three, we will meet those that have died before us. From that, I would then pick up verse 15. For this we declare to you by a word from the Lord, that we who are alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will not precede those who have fallen asleep. Then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. I'd also go through, if you're discussing soul sleep, there's actually a lot of references I thought about putting in here. The words, of course, in the book of Hebrews that relate to the cloud of witnesses and all those witnesses in heaven looking down from us, I think would be a good reading for you if it's something you're struggling with. How could it be a cloud of witnesses if they were in the soul sleep, if you all follow my point? And additionally, this one verse I'll leave you with, Luke 23, 42 and 43, these two verses, where the thief on the cross next to Jesus is asking you know, this one question. And he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus responds, and he said to him, truly, I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. The question of the week, focusing on the sanctification part of our lesson for today, how would God have me live this week? How would God have me live this week? He's got a plan for your day. He's got a plan for your week. He knows all the things that are going to happen. How is it that he wants you to walk in the next seven days? Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Lord, Heavenly Father, I thank you for all those listening and perhaps those who might be listening over the internet to this at some later time. I just ask that you bless each and every one of us and every one of them. And if any of them choose to wish to join us here at church, ask that they would take that step to come and join us for next Sunday's service. In Jesus Christ's name I pray. Amen.